Welcome to our Consumer Speaks podcast series, where you'll hear from industry leaders as they share their perspective and insights on emerging topics impacting financial reporting in the consumer industry. We will be discussing the current expected credit loss accounting standard, known as CECL, and some considerations for companies in the consumer industry. Joining us today are Troy Volston and John Howard. Troy is a partner and the Audit and Assurance Banking and Capital Markets Leader with Deloitte & Touche. He works closely with companies on corporate governance and methodology and models for the allowance for loan losses and the adoption of CECL. John is an Audit and Assurance Partner in the Financial Instruments Group of the Accounting and Reporting Services of Deloitte's National Office and serves on the Financial Accounting Standards Board Transition Resource Group for Credit Losses. Thanks, Troy and John, for helping us with CECL today. John, let's kick it off with you. I thought it would be helpful for you to begin by providing background on why and how the CECL standard came about. Can you talk to us a little bit about that background, John? Sure. Thanks, Rich. Um, CECL is really in response to the credit crisis and concerns that our existing impairment models resulted in losses being recognized and reported too little too late. So what it did is it removes the probable uh, threshold that you it has to be probable that you've already incurred a loss. I think when they were focusing on this project, and when I say they, I'm saying the FASB, uh, they started to realize that it's not just banks that do lending activities. So if you think about it, you know, even in the consumer space, you might have retailers that provide credit for their clients, uh, and you have a lot of non-traditional banks that are doing lending type activities. So while this started with a focus probably more towards banks and traditional lending institutions, uh, it really became something that was a, a bit bigger than that as they tried to come up with a single impairment model that's not industry specific, but more focuses on the nature of the asset and that being a financial asset with contractual cash flows. That's a great point, John, that, that last point there about this being industry agnostic and, and really the point of today's podcast. Troy, given your experience, would you mind expanding a little bit on companies that are not typical financial institutions that are consumer industry and, and you know, the impact of the CECL standard to them? The main reason for the impact beyond banks is this really does apply to any receivable. John mentioned that financial assets are, are the scope and accounts receivable, longer term lending uh, type assets, et cetera, all come in. The reason it's so impactful is it, while you use historical data in current events under the incurred loss model, under the CECL model, you're also now incorporating forecasting i.e. your expectation of future events to get to your expected loss. As a result, some of the entities and, and sectors within the industry that will be more likely impacted uh, or more significantly impacted will include those that have financing subsidiaries, for example, auto financing or credit card receivables, entities that offer timeshares, and manufacturers or retailers that offer longer term financing to their customers as part of the terms and conditions of their sales. I think a lot of consumer companies might have saw this standard come out and thought this might be more focused on financial institutions. And it is clear now that this is much broader. As we think about the adoption of CESOL, the required adoption for public companies, Troy, what, what should companies be doing to prepare for adoption of the CESOL standard? First step, Rich, is really to assess what are the assets you may have that are impacted. That's the key to really beginning the process. Um, many companies, in fact, most companies will likely have assets that are within the scope of CECL. You then pivot to thinking about how much will it impact you? And some of the things for companies to consider is the, the life of their assets. Um, when you talk about forecasting and interacting future events, with your expectations of credit loss, the longer that period is, the bigger an impact that the forecast may have. So thinking through what those are and being able to assess those impacts and, and be able to start to quantify them is important. Even if you do believe that this may not be material to you, there are a couple things you want to think about as a company. One, what are the documentation requirements you're going to need to go through to um, memorialize that assessment? How do you conclude it's immaterial? And most importantly, how do you continue to monitor that? Not only will the external environment continue to evolve, we will have a recession at some point in the future. How will you factor that in? 
You also need to monitor your own credit standards. What have you changed? Are you offering different terms? Are you offering longer terms? Those type of things should be part of a controlled process that's evaluated on a recurring basis by companies to ensure that they've appropriately scoped and captured their assets. Troy, real helpful as we as we help companies think through the adoption. Hey, John, would you like to share some of your perspectives on what consumer companies should be doing to, to be ready for the adoption of Cecil? As Troy said, I think one of the biggest things first is, you know, figuring out what's in the scope. And, you know, that's a financial assets that are carried at amortized cost. Now, thinking about the new model and that it's not probable that you've already incurred a loss, and it really is based on, you know, what do you expect to collect even from the minute you get involved with an asset. You know, it does kind of have a forward-looking notion, as Troy talked about, but the foundation really is your own personal historical loss. So there's not necessarily a need to go get fair value type information and market information as the foundation. And so it's really just making sure for entities that, that haven't necessarily been keeping that sort of data, that this is data that needs to be tracked, that needs to be kept, um, so that you have an ability to make reasonable and supportable uh, estimates, and, and that this is something that's now going to be subject to you know, internal controls over financial reporting as well. So there might be data that you've been using for credit decisions or data that you've been using for budgets, uh, but you know, that's now going to feed into financial reporting as well. So I think that's that's one thing I you know the first thing that entities probably need to think about. And then secondly, this is you know sometimes overlooked. This isn't just an accounting standard. There are some new disclosures too. Um, now, not all of the disclosures are applicable to all assets and all entities. There are a lot of the disclosures don't apply to trade receivables that arise from revenue transactions as long as they're less than a year. Uh, but still, that does require you understanding what's in the scope and even bucketing them for purposes of being able to provide the disclosures. And I know your study of the CECL standard has been, been broader than just talking to Deloitte's clients and your participation on the FASB's transition resource group. What are some of the implementation challenges that you're hearing about as part of those broader conversations? Most of the issues that have been dealt with at the transition resource group and a lot of the things that have been surfaced so far have been primarily, you know, loan driven uh, questions and, and things of that nature. And, and it clearly uh, is because this is going to be a, probably a much bigger deal to banks and, and traditional lending activities just because of the size of their balance sheets and, and the size of the assets that this is in the scope of. And now that you're trying to make estimates of lifetime losses for, you know, assets that might have really long Long lives, you know, that's where a lot of the questions have arisen so far is, you know, how much can I use my historical data? How much do I need to maybe tweak it to be able to, to plug into these models? And, and so, um, you know, for entities that, that really don't have big lending type activities, you know, the, the efforts won't be quite as big to try to, to, you know, essentially accelerate those those losses that you might wait until you've already had a loss event and make sure you're recognizing them up front. But at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're probably, the shorter the life of the asset is, the less you really need to make projections about what's going to happen in the future and how that might impact losses. So far, the questions that have come up have really been more by, you know, the nature of actual more traditional loans. Uh, the shorter lived assets, this probably isn't going to have as much of a timing impact. Um, but I would say the, the, the things that now are starting to come up are, okay, we're starting to understand the accounting model, but you know, how do we uh, try to start talking about the impact of this with our uh, financials, you know, uh, analysts and the users and, and making sure that we're communicating where we're at in this process. So it's not even just the accounting, but it's trying to explain to people for a standard that's going to be effective for public companies the end of, you know, of this year, where we're at in our process and trying to make sure that all the different parts of the entity that are required to pull this off are talking to each other. And that's not, this is not something you just hand off to the accounting, you know, uh, financial reporting controllers groups and say, you know, give us the allowance and give us disclosures. It does require discussions with credit uh, groups and, 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 you know, budgeting groups that have more insight into the, the expectations of what's going to happen in the future or that are making the decisions about maybe new customer bases or new products that you're doing. So I think it's really just trying to kind of get all of those entities that might within a particular organization that might not have been dealing with each other on a, on a regular basis for financial reporting purposes and now kind of getting it into, you know, one uh, repeatable process.
Yeah, so it sounds, John, from from those comments there, it's it's going to be uh, um, there's going to be some careful consideration as it relates to not only identifying the right data as it relates to these portfolio of in scope instruments, but then also the the much broader implication of of taking that data, running it through a model that's compliant with the accounting standard, making sure the right information is being communicated to. Um, not only you know through the financial statements, but to the broader stakeholder groups of the company, and so it sounds like there's a, a real thoughtful process that's going to be necessary to to implement this standard in a in a real impactful way. So, Troy, switching switching over to you, Troy, are there things that we're talking to consumer and and, and, you know, and broader type of companies um, that they could benefit from as it relates to CISO and some best practices and some ways for us to to help use the, the, you know, the effort that John just walked through to, to improve on processes and procedures and, and the way stakeholders are being interacted with. Yes, absolutely, Rich. I think John hit it spot on. And I think this is probably one of the, the little sneaky secrets around Cecil. This is not just an accounting standard. This involves a lot of different groups within a company. And John laid out uh, a lot of them. Uh, I think involves the folks in budgeting. It involves the people that are making the credit decisions. And he also laid out the fact that it's going to be impacting data. So you're impacting IT. Um, these folks are, are going to start to communicate more frequently than they have in the past. There are opportunities for uh, tighter, tighter disclosures around what's driving the changes in the entity's results from a credit perspective. It also will allow a uh, better foresight into what are the what are the options as you consider changing how you may extend credit to your customers, the terms. What may that mean in terms of different environments, utilizing some of these modeling techniques to be able to assess not only the impact today, uh, and, and for example, today is a relatively stable environment. What would it mean in the downturn? What would it mean in a recovery? Those kind of things will allow companies to more fully flush out the potential impacts of decisions on their future financials as a result of this uh, this modeling exercise. Well, Troy and John, really appreciate your time and your insight. I know the adoption of CECL is going to be a challenge for a lot of folks and, and, and our concern as it relates to consumer companies is that they might not be as focused on the, on the topic as maybe some of the financial institutions. So everyone, as you heard today, focusing on, on the process and understanding the challenges of implementation and taking advantage of the information that's obtained and the conversation with stakeholders is really the key as this implementation is upon us here. I'd like to, again, thank Troy and, and John, our Deloitte leaders that are with us here today. If you have any questions about today's topic, please feel free to contact me, Rich Paul, at rpaul at Deloitte.com. Troy Ballerston at T-B-O-L-L-E-R-T-S-E-N at Deloitte.com or John Howard at J-O-N-A-H-O-W-A-R-D at Deloitte.com. Thanks and talk to you next time.